Hello and welcome, Rookie Card Collecting Friends. Victor, the Rookie Card Specialist, coming at you with another video podcast titled Sports Cards, Hobby News and Views. I am bringing this back. I did my first episode of this last week, and it was just more of a uh, spur of the moment type of thing. Uh, nothing really that I was going to be planning, but I got some really good feedback on it. And I figured um, it wouldn't hurt to do these types of videos every once in a while. I know the the topic of the rookie card can be polarizing and wouldn't hurt to perhaps uh, change gears once in a while to give my opinion, my thoughts on current hobby happenings and give uh, a little bit of commentary on that sort of thing. Now, the typical hobby news and views is pretty rampant on the YouTube side of things and probably even on the podcast side of things. Uh, but this week's latest and greatest topics deals with staged hobby content, fanatics pursuit of influencers and breakers being caught on camera on, on the um, website. What, what not? And <laughs> the litany of opinions, the the portrayal of more shadiness uh, needs to be cleaned up. And, and we need somebody with the uh, legal authority to, I guess, to, to, to come in and, and kind of put a stop to this kind of thing. I don't know how they're going to do it. Fanatics is going to have their hands full. Uh, they'll just have to keep vetting and keep. Uh, uh, you know, getting into these type of things and with a little bit more harsher of consequences. And, and all of this is nothing new. All of this has been said many times before. And I don't really feel like getting into the details of this because I feel like so much has been said already that I'm just going to be regurgitating uh, what you have probably heard already. And so I don't want to regurgitate that sort of things. If you're interested in these three topics, uh, you can just punch them in on YouTube. Everybody's talking about these types of topics. Um, you know, the, the, the stage hobby content. I mean, yeah, it, it just leaves a bad taste. It's just kind of um, disingenuous, inauthentic. Uh, but I can tell you, I don't know about you, but, you know, for me, I can kind of tell on that kind of stuff. You can kind of tell the the phoniness of certain things. You can pick up on it if you're paying attention. Um, you know, fanatics pursuing other influencers. I mean, you know, they're they're pursuing the big time influencers, and uh, I don't blame them. I think it's a great move. Now, I think there should be some some vetting, and and there should be a, a contract sign that that gives consequences. You know. Um, these guys, uh, backyard breaks, you know, we've already had a couple of miscues and if you're going to use them, you know, I don't blame you for using them because they have a big audience, but there has to be consequences. If, if there's shadiness, you've got to cut the umbilical cord and, and, and let these folks go because they're going to be doing more harm than good. And, and, uh, I think fanatics is going to have to make an example out of somebody. They're going to have to uh, really uh, uh, take the bull by the horns here and really uh, uh, communicate expectations and hold people accountable to those expectations. If you're going to use their platforms and their influence to, to further your cause. And so um, I don't know, it's just, man, I wish we can get rid of this type of stuff in the hobby when it comes to like shadiness and that kind of thing. But let me tell you, so long as there's people involved, uh, I don't see that ever happening because wherever there's people, wherever there's money, there's going to be corruption and there's going to be uh, these types of activities. And the only thing we can do is clean it up and move on. And that's, that's what's, that's what hasn't been happening. We got people that are being caught. People that are, you know, and, and we they continue to uh, excel in their platforms. They continue to get allocation of product. They continue to just go on business as usual. And, and I don't know, there, there has to be some type of 
policy in place where if you're going to use these types of people, there has to be something, something, uh, an expectation. And so that's all I'm going to say about that. Let me move on to what's really been on my heart and mind this week. Uh, and that is number one, the WBC, the world baseball classic and the absolute blast I had watching these games. Folks, if you are a baseball fan and you did not watch this tournament, I'm going to question your fandom and I'm going to do it in fun. So don't take me too seriously. Uh, my point is, is that these games were absolutely phenomenal. The storyline, the drama, the t intensity of each and every game uh, just had a feel of of a true world series. And, and uh, you know, there's some criticisms out there, uh, but I don't, I don't care about their criticisms. Uh, some of the criticisms, you know, had to deal with, you know, the time of year, whether it, this should be done mid season, end of season. Uh, my opinion on that is it is done at the perfect time of year. March is the perfect time to have this right in the middle of spring training. Uh, you can uh, bring in the other, uh, what, what you haven't noticed, maybe you have, maybe you haven't, but these teams have also been allowed to have uh, scrimmage games with the MLB ball clubs, with, you know, and that is so cool to see. It might not be in the, in the tournament, but in between games, right? They're able to go and play uh, with major league ball clubs at in at the um, spring training facilities, and I just I just love that that concept. And and so you know, the time of the time of you know some of the games in the first rounds was a little rough, only because uh, you know some of them were were done in in other nations and hey but that's all part of it that that's you know hey set your dvr like i did and and if you're that interested you can watch it the next day or, or listen to it um to and from work or something the uh, the the thing is is that this tournament is absolutely amazing and and i uh, applaud Everybody that was involved, these players, you can just tell the the seriousness they took to it all. They loved it. The ball players absolutely loved it. The fans absolutely loved it. There is nothing really to critique here uh, except get on board, man, and, and lighten up. You know, uh, injuries are unfortunate, uh, especially with my team Puerto Rico. What the heck they... <laughs> Oh man, was that heartbreaking to see in the middle of their celebration, we end up injuring a ball player uh, by one of our own players. And he is, I guess, lost for the entire season. Edwin Diaz, closer for the New York Mets. Look, things like that. I hear uh, Altuve uh, took an injury to his thumb that's going to uh, need surgery. Uh, there's a couple other injuries in there but you know that's that's really unfortunate and and but that's that's to me is he, he could have gotten injured in spring training he he could have taken a, a a fastball off his thumb in spring training so what i mean i don't know it is um something that i truly uh, uh enjoy watching uh team japan i i guess yeah, on japan i watched a a documentary the other day, uh, the, I guess Japan, uh, kudos to them. Congratulations to all the Japanese fans. What a ball club they put together. What amazing talent they put together. And they came back and they just uh, dominated this thing uh, uh, through and through. Uh, shout out to the U.S. baseball team who really had their backs up against the wall against Mexico, right? And they've they decided they're going to turn it on and they fought back to make it to the final round and they played spectacular as well. Mexico. I was like a little upset because they lost to Mexico in the first round. And I'm like, what the heck? Why do, who the heck? Why the heck would they lose to Mexico? What is going on with Mexico? They seem to always lose against Mexico, 
But then when you when I watched a game with Mexico, I forget who they were playing, but Mexico just absolutely dominated. I think it was the Venezuelan team. Uh, Mexico just had an absolutely amazing team, and they played tough, and they had all the pieces of the puzzle together. And I'm telling you what, I'm telling you, collectors out there, baseball collectors out there, we really need to reconsider uh, Randy Arozarena. Uh, uh, we call him here uh, Randy Arroz con Gandules because that's what his name sounds like. <laughs> but anyways, uh, the the play that this kid, the show that this kid put on, what a hot dog, and, and boy, did I love it. What exciting baseball that was. And here's the thing with, about Randy. He seems to have a flair for big games. This guy in in, in – um, World Series play, whether it comes in the in the postseason or whatnot, this kid really turns it on, and he is one that just like takes over a game, uh, offensively, defensively. This kid is just amazing, and I'm gonna tell you what, uh, I'm gonna really look at this kid's career, and and a really his story is amazing. Um, but he's given me a few memorable moments already that I wouldn't mind having a few of his cards in my PC. And I don't care about value, but I care about the experience and uh, that he's given me watching him play. And those are the kind of players that I like to collect. Somebody who really grabbed my attention. And those are the players I have a lot of respect for. Those are the players that I like to spend my hobby dollars on. Uh, and he has triggered my curiosity more than once. And I think I'm going to pick up a few of his um, rookie cards. And then we had the, the final game. What, it, it couldn't have been written any better. I'm telling you, what a showdown between Showtime and Mike Trout. Teammates, mind you. And Mike Trout getting some slack. Right. It's like, OK, because he made the last out of the game and he struck out against uh, Shohei Otani. Uh, I don't think Mike I, I think Mike should hold his head up high. I, I think he played good. I think the U.S. wouldn't have even been to that final round had it not been for Mike Trout's performance the game before. And and so uh, he had a clutch double that advanced them to the next round. And, and those are the types of things I think that people miss uh, between the lines. And we're just going for the, the most recent headline. And now we want to write off Mike Trout like he's a piece of garbage and he's not. Mike Trout is a phenomenal ball player. And um, Mike Trout's story does not end with that strikeout at the WBC. Um, I think he handled it very well. I seen a post of his on Facebook and he seems to be very proud of Shohei and, and uh, very proud of the U S team. And he's a, uh, he's, he's a stand up guy in my opinion. Um, but man, what a, what a story, what a great tournament. I'm a big fan of the WPC. I've watched, you know, I think this is my third one that I have watched uh, in its entirety. And, and I tell you what, what great baseball, I tell you uh, it, to me, it just, sends baseball to a, to a whole nother level and, you know, players that don't want to get involved or don't want to participate, man, that's your loss, buddy. That's your loss. And I would even venture to say, you know, uh, being uh bar, it being, you know, something personal like an injury or, or perhaps you need to, you know, spend some time with your family. Those are the only exceptions that I can, uh, I can really stomach for this type of thing. But for those who, who don't have, a, you know, who are single or just don't want to participate out of selfishness, you know, I say shame on you and and represent your country, uh, represent a country, and get out there and play some competitive ball in the month of March. Anyways, enough talk about that. Let's move on. I had somebody reach out to me uh, in my last episode of Hobby News and Views. They wanted me to talk a little bit about retail product and what did I think was going to be the um, the outcome of, of retail product. 
And I told him that I would definitely give this a mention on my uh, next episode of Hobby News and Views. So here we go. Retail product. What are my thoughts on retail product going forward? I think they're going to, in order for them to accomplish what they want to accomplish, uh, which is this whole 10x concept idea, which I find kind of, you know, it's just, I don't know, upper brass always shooting for the stars, right? And I don't, you know, the execution of that is always where the mid-level guys and the guys on the ground have kind of a tendency to kind of like scratch their heads and say, hmm, that's going to be a tough one. But that's the goal, right? So how are they going to do that? They're going to, well, they're kind of giving us glimpses already how they're going to do it. You know, they're going to um, make sure that we have enough product on the shelves at the retail level. And, and, I, and they're doing an excellent job of that. Uh, but is it selling? I, I guess is the question. Will it sell is the question. And I think two things on that. I think all of this mass producing of product at the retail level will sell if number one, they have to include some type, some type of chase card, right? They have to, uh, kind of like they did in the mid nineties. Uh, it turned into everybody pursuing the chase card. That means there was one or two specific cards within the set that were very, um, low pop that were very scarce, some type of gimmick that's going to inspire people to rip open packs, right. And look for that golden ticket per se. If they, if they come up with a gimmick like that, they'll sell retail product, but also that re we need to be able to verify those types of things. Cause in the past they, they would promote these gimmicks and there's, you, you never saw, you never saw them come to fruition or you did very rarely. I, I think if they were to, um, you know, get an opportunity to um, market this, uh, chase card and and really you know bring it to you know look at so-and-so he pulled the julio frank julio rodriguez 101 gold vinyl or what have you right and so i think that's that's one way the second is i think they have to bring value back to the base rookie card now i've talked a lot about this topic but if they want to sell out if they want to 10x the hobby if they want to the retail product to move from store shelves we have to change the mindset the idea that base rookie cards are garbage and in doing so right we will move product from retail store shelves now how would how do we do that that's the great that's the question right that's a good question we do that by perhaps serial numbering base rookie cards again and you can serial number your parallels as well i think another good idea is to continue the image variant now with that said i would say that here has been the long time hobby standard when it comes to image variants so long as the card back and the card number were the same those were viewed and considered rookie cards and the image front could be whatever you want it to be. But that has been a long time hobby standard, a tradition that has been handed down from generation to generation, or that should be handed down from generation to generation. And, you know, these SPs and SSPs, they're really image variants is what they are. But in order for them to be considered a true rookie card, coming out of the base set, they should be the same card back and the same card number. Doing that, we are going to revitalize, I believe, retail product. The other topic I wanted to tackle was the NIL product. And we're starting to see it more and more. Now, here's my thoughts, my views on collegiate product, okay? Card manufacturers have been trying to shove collegiate product down our throats for decades. 
this is not a new idea. This goes back to the 90s. It's the concept has never really taken off. The overall consensus is collectors prefer cards of players in their pro uniform. The guidelines that were established for the rookie card in 2005 states that a rookie card must feature a player it at the pro level roster, right? And so here we have college students now. And I think there is a sect of the hobby that loves this stuff, that prefers this stuff. And I don't think there's nothing wrong with that. I think card manufacturers should meet the needs of those collectors and absolutely should manufacture that product for those collectors. Nothing wrong with that. However, we got to be careful, in my opinion anyways, of what kind of identifier we put on these cards. I know that they came out with overtime elite basketball. And I made videos on it and ranted and raved because I could not believe that they put RC logos on that product. That product absolutely has no business with RC logos. These players are not in, they do not belong as members of the Players Association. They are not licensed by a, 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 a league or a pro-level league, right? And they put an RC logo on those cards. So in creating... NIL product, collegiate product. There shouldn't be any RC logo on these things. Create one of your, I mean, create one. If you want to put one, put, you know, P, I, I love PR's pre-rookie card or prospect rookie card or collegiate rookie card. Uh, but I think uh, drawing a line of clarity should be done. I love what they've done in baseball product. They don't have any identifiers on baseball product as it shouldn't because it's not a rookie card according to the standards set by the PA. So the, what they're doing there is perfectly fine. I think they need to follow suit with the collegiate football and collegiate basketball and collegiate anything. I'm going to move on to Rob Barris. I want to talk about Rob Varis for a minute. This guy has really, um, he's really grabbed my attention this past week. And he's, he's grabbed my attention for some time now. I just haven't really processed all of my thoughts, but this guy is amazing. What this guy is doing in the hobby. I think he's one of the most underrated men let me rephrase that. He is one of the most underrated leaders in the industry today. And if you don't know who Rob Varis is, Rob Varis, he is the owner of Burbank Sports Cards in, in California, in Burbank, California. He is responsible for developing some really good card shows here recently in the, in the, in the West Coast. He's... Uh, taking that on and he is really uh the, the content that he is putting out uh specifically on instagram you can find him do uh, um almost daily and the things that he is sharing the tricks of the trade that he is showing he's his doors have been his life and the way he runs his business has been an open book for everybody for many years now and he shows us how he inventories. He shows us the process and the procedure of, of how he filters cards and sends them to this spot and, and how he organizes and how he has his showcases organized and, and how he has this room for, for a specific reason and that room for a specific reason. And he just lays it. His, his entire business plan is just laid out before our very eyes. 
The guy is an open book. The guy is an innovator. The guy is a trailblazer. The guy is a visionary. The guy is an apostle of this hobby, and he's severely underrated. Friends, be careful who you listen to. Be careful because there's a lot of false prophets out there. <laughs> I'm very cautious of who I listen to. Rob Veris is a man we should be listening to. I watched a video with him this past week. And he gave his flat out straight up opinion about the Mint Collective. He didn't speak poorly of it. But he spoke about it as far as why it doesn't work for him. And he went on to give some examples of what they should do. Ideas on what they should do. And, and I tell you, man, the, the guy, I'm telling you, he's, he's on another level, folks. He's on another level. And we're, we're listening to people who have been, come into this hobby two, three years ago and have deep pockets and fancy production. And those are the people we gravitate to. But this man's been in the hobby 20, 30, 40 years. Profoundly experienced he's been doing this day in and day out for decades he's an open book his life his business is an open book that's the man i want to say i want to ask questions to that's the man i want to listen to but i don't hear nobody talking about rob Veris. i hear very little people talking about rob Veris. friends He's a hobby goat. He's up there with Dr. Beckett. The guy is in the trenches. The guy is in the front lines. Do yourself a favor and follow Rob Veras. Follow Burbank Sports Cards on YouTube and Instagram and start listening to the right people. Moving on. Something else that's been in my in my hobby news and views this past week. And that is PSA fives. I know I recently got a submission back and I sent a, a, an insert card of Michael Jordan. 1995 top 10 Fleer. I forget the name of it now. I posted it on my Instagram. You can see it there. The card was pretty clean. I mean, really, really clean. I've been looking at cards for a very long time. And I said to myself, this is a solid nine. And the only reason it's not a 10 is because it's a Michael Jordan insert. And those, you're not going to get tens of those very easily nowadays. But it's, it's going to, it's a solid nine. It came back in eight. Eights are great. But then I start to look at social media threads, keeping up with things. It's what I like to do. And I noticed people with posts like, can you tell me where and how this is a PSA 5? Maybe you know what I'm talking about. Maybe you've seen it. And if you didn't, here's what's going on. It seems like you can send in a, a, a card. And it usually when you send a bulk of cards in, right? And you'll get one back that is an ultra modern card, right? A card that was produced within the last few years. And just out of the blue, it gets a PSA five. And when you look at the definitions for a PSA five in PSA's website, it'll tell you 
why they gave it that grade. So it gives you a list of defects. But when you look at the card with the naked eye, even if you look at the card under uh, a magnification and a light, you cannot see anywhere how this card can get a five. I've been there. It's happened to me. And my my neon light just went out. It looks like the batteries went dead. I kind of figured that was going to happen. So excuse the, that side of that of the video. But here's the thing. PSA 5s. How can a card that looks mint or gem mint end up being a PSA 5? There's a lot of speculation out there, right? It's rigged. They're doing it on purpose. Um, they don't know what they're doing. A lot of, a lot of reasoning behind it, right? And I understand. I feel you. And I think you got a legitimate complaint. And I would love PSA to really explain that to us. Because we start to justify in our own minds. And, and I hear, I see people on videos even, that they'll try to, oh, maybe it's, Maybe it's this little, little dingy dingy mark here, or maybe it's, I don't know, maybe it's got a crease somewhere and I just don't see it. Or we, we, be, we begin to try to justify the PSA five. Here's what I would love to tell the PSA. Just grade the damn card. Grade it for what it is. And that's it. Don't worry about population reports. Stop trying to manage the population reports. Just see the card, gray the card. That's what we're paying you to do. Moving on. I wanted to talk a little bit about a video I did with Dr. Beckett. I've had a somebody DM me on, on something, and I, I just wanted to bring clarity on a situation. And, and I'm not speaking for Dr. Beckett. Um, I probably should run this past Dr. Beckett. Maybe I'll bring it up next time I do a, a show with him or something. Um, but I did a video with him and he, we were talking about the rookie card identifier and some of the decisions that he had to make back in the 1980s. And in that dialogue, he made a comment and said something. The, like, and there were still people that wanted to insist that 83 tops extended Daryl strawberry was, was the card to get and was indeed a full rookie card. Mm. And I, I do not agree. I mean, I, I put an XRC on there on purpose. I think it's an extended rookie card. It's a type of rookie card that is not universally accepted. It, it predates is it's like a pre rookie card. And there's an interpretation out there from that video that people seem to think that Dr. Beckett was the one to purposely cause confusion on the rookie card. And, and that's where I kind of like, wow, wait a minute here, time out. So I, I paid attention. I, I rewatched my video and I, and, and just listening and talking to him several times as I have now, I don't, I don't think that that was the case. I think he was the one responsible for making certain decisions. And what he was doing was he was throwing out feelers out there. So he would like for the 1983 Daryl Strawberry put RC logo question, RC question mark on the magazine, on the price guides. And I think what he was doing was looking for feedback, right? He, this, this whole rookie card identifier thing was in the early stages of its, of its development. And he was trying to get hobby feedback. And so he would throw out little things like that and see how collectors would respond. And that kind of Intel, that kind of feedback is what helped him and his team develop a, a, a more solid uh, definition as the years went on. And, and I don't, I don't think, I think people are taking that out of context. I will clarify that with him when I get a chance. Um, but with that said, guys, I am, uh, I wanted to get this video out prior to the mint collective uh, going out uh, this weekend, because I know I, I, I believe Fanatics is going to be announcing a really big uh, announcement that is going to be generational. It's going to be uh, hobby changing. And so 
I wanted to, uh, cause I wanted my next episode of hobby news and views to kind of reflect what, what, uh, fanatics announcement is going to be. So I wanted to get my, I wanted to clear the slate, I guess you could say in my head before the announcement came out. Uh, so, um, also, the uh, feedback from my last video that I had with Edward Healy as we discussed the Ten Commandments of the Rookie Card. The, the video was an absolute success. Um, lots of great feedback, lots of support, lots of views. And uh, I'm in the process right now of writing, um, writing a new set of guidelines I've actually, I'm on a week's vacation this week and I actually set some time aside these for the next uh, few days or so. I'm going to be spending time rewriting uh, the Ten Commandments of the rookie card in its entirety. We're going to bring uh, a little bit more clarity as far as like, hey, so this rule here, uh, what about if it's a card from 1962? Uh, well, you know, so I'm, I'm going to be bringing... Uh, a little bit more commentary, a little bit more explanation uh, so that we have a better understanding of, of, of this resource. So a lot of, a lot of good, a lot of positive things on, on the horizon. Uh, I've got an announcement myself that I'm, I'm going to be releasing uh, probably when I get closer to the national and um, looking forward to everything that the hobby has in store for this year. I'm, I'm just really excited, really grateful for uh, everything going on. And I'm really grateful for you tuning in. So if you made it this far, I appreciate you. And I'll check you guys out on the next one.